actually helped my immediate success because I worked really, really hard to try to be a good collector. I, you know, believe in a lot of these ideas that, you know, you have to be a hard worker, you have to produce for your company, you have to believe in your company. And so for about six months, I made more phone calls than anybody. I did more research. I stayed after. I wanted to figure out how the people at the upper echelon of this company were making three or four hundred thousand dollars a year and not really doing very much. I had to figure that out. And my epiphany was that debts are not paid with the results of labor. They're paid with other debts. If you want to get paid in debt collection, you don't get $50 a month from a single mother. You have to find somebody who has the privilege, the access to capital, the family network, that they can get someone else to pay their debt for them. So when I had that epiphany, it really made me question <coughs> this whole system we had. Because the reality is, these debts cannot be paid back. If you want to collect them, you have to create another debt. Um, so for instance, and this is so true in the, in the whole mortgage crisis. You know, all of that debt had to be paid off in bailouts because there was literally no other way for us to keep this system going. So what I would do <laughs> is I would convince people who had sixty dollars to $100,000 worth of debt that they should take out a subprime mortgage and they should add their debt to the existing debt that they had for their homes. And they could pay off all their debt. And they would have one simple, easy monthly payment that would actually be less than what they were paying for their mortgage right now. I created a wonderful picture of this process being able to help them alleviate themselves from debt. I didn't tell them that three years later, somebody would ask them for $5,000 a month for their home. I didn't tell them that they were gonna get foreclosed. I didn't tell them that what they were doing could literally ruin their lives. And me and millions of other people, once they deregulated um, the banking industry and allowed for variable rate uh, mortgages, convinced all these people who were already in debt to take out their homes, to put their homes against their debt, and to put themselves further in debt. And then they lose their homes, and I'm still calling them up to pay back the difference between the sale of their homes and their mortgage. We all know that in poor neighborhoods, banks don't turn over homes. They let them sit there. They let them get dilapidated. It's part of what we do with PUSH, is trying to address this issue. In rich neighborhoods, where they think that they can make money off the homes that they take, they are there the next day to get your stuff out, to fix everything up, to make it look nice so another rich person can incur more debt by taking out another mortgage. And it's part of this inherent relationship between debt and privilege. And the reason that the debt industry is so racist and has so, such an uh, impact on people of color, because we don't have the, the privilege, we don't have the networks, the families, the daddies, the uncles, the people that are willing to use their access to capital to cover our debts. And therefore, poor people, black people, people in certain neighborhoods are charged higher interest rates. Not because there's any less likelihood of them being a good person and paying their debt, but because the reality is people don't stop paying debts because they're bad people. They stop paying debts because they can't, because they have a child because they changed jobs, because they got fired, because something in their life happened that didn't allow them to pay that back. And if you're poor, if you're a person of color, if you're an immigrant, and you don't have someone in your life that's willing to do that for you, then you are never gonna be able to pay that back. And they know that. So they try to milk you up front. Instead of getting a 3% interest rate, you get a 13% interest rate, because they know they need to get their money now. Now, if you are a privileged white male who lives in a zip code that has a median income of 90 grand, they'll give you a 3% interest rate. Because they know that number one, if you do not pay their debts, you will have assets, you will have other ways. They know that you are benefiting from the system and a collector like me can make you think that that is the most important thing for your future to pay that debt. And they know from the jump that the poor single mother who's living in public housing is never going to be able to get them out of the situation they put them in. So there's some inherent racism, and there's also some pragmatism that says, if we're going to be profitable companies, who are we going to charge the most money? The people who are going to be paying us for 30 years or the people who are going to be paying us for three years? Um, and so when you realize that debt isn't paid for with work, but it's paid for other debt, you start to see that at some point, we have to use some of the tactics we're going to talk about later to try to transition to this economy. Because right now, we are propping up an enormous weight that at some point we're going to have to deal with. Um, and the bailouts are a perfect example of how uh, debts have to be paid for with other debts. <coughs> it really introduced me to this concept of privilege. 
because I really struggled with this idea in collections that you shouldn't call a single mother, that you should not, um, you know, that you basically shouldn't call black people, you, you shouldn't call Hispanic people. And I, I struggle with that as somebody who really, um, you know, does a lot of anti-racism work. But eventually, I had to come to the realization that certain people have more access to things than other people. And it was really hard for me because um, I wanted to defend my people when people on the collection floor would say, oh, well, why are you calling that person? Her name is Shaniqua. You know, with dealing with those microaggressions of people talking about my people in such a pejorative way. But at the end of the day, to make profit, I had to accept the fact that there is this thing called privilege, that some people have an easier time getting through life than others, and some people have all kinds of ways to help them. And it really was my introduction to really how race and capitalism are so uh, uniquely intertwined. Um, and another thing I learned is that <coughs> rich people don't pay their debts either. Rich people, people with access to capital. Yes. <laughs> when I was in student loans, um, how many people here have student loans? Okay. How many people have consolidated them? Okay. So they tell you to consolidate your loans, number one, because they want to extend the time period that you're going to be paying. Anybody who knows anything about interest knows the longer you pay, the more you pay. Well, consolidation allows for rich, smart people to not have to pay their debts back, especially doctors, lawyers, people who are in school for a very long time, until they're established enough to insulate themselves from the consequences. So I would call billionaires. Um, one guy, he, was, he invented uh, porcelain veneers to own the company, 1-800 Veneers. The man was worth $1.2 billion. I call him up on the phone, and I say, you have $1.7 million worth of student loan debt. This is obviously how you got to the position you are, because of the education that was provided for you with this debt. So, you're worth $1.2 billion. When are you going to write me a check? I thought it would be simple. Maybe you overlooked it. Maybe you forgot it. And he laughed at me. And he said, what are you going to do? What can you do to me? to make me pay this debt. And I didn't have an answer for it. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely nothing that I could do to affect his life to force him to pay that debt. And so the, a lot, a large percentage of what we see in the student loan debt market are people of privilege, are people who have enormous amounts of education that realize that I don't have to pay it back. There's nothing that you can do to threaten me because everything that I have is isolated in this infrastructure of finance that allows rich people in the know to not have to pay back into the system. Um, can you go to the next slide? The next one? Yeah. So uh, this is a quote here from Henry Ford. It says, it is well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking system and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. So the number one message I want to get across is that for those organizers here who are working on issues of debt, it is our responsibility to help people understand how the game works. Help people understand that their oppression, the struggles, the feelings that they have about paying off debts, the, the cries that I used to hear on the phone of people who just couldn't pay back their debt and felt so sick to their stomachs about it that they couldn't sleep at night, that, that these debts have already been paid, that we don't owe anybody any, anything. Um, in Occupy, we use this phrase, you are not alone. You are not alone. We are here together, and also you are not defined by what you had to take out to live your life. You are not defined by your death. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. You, mm -hmm. said, you said this gentleman was in, was in $1.7 billion in debt. One point student, million dollars. Million, million dollars in debt, and they were all student loans. Right. So, the gentleman that owed the money was he profitable? Did he have a job? Did he own his own business? Yeah, he owned a company called One Eight Hundred Veneers that sold basically the process for replacing your teeth with porcelain veneers. Oh, okay. So, so therefore, he had to pay taxes. No, that's not. Did he pay, pay taxes? Did he pay ta did he, that's what I'm asking. Did he pay taxes? Well, I don't know personally. I assume that because of the corporate structure in America, that he was able to find ways to write off his taxes, find ways to offset the money that was spent, um, you know, through limited liability corporations, so that he did not have to pay taxes. Okay. The only reason why I asked that specific question is 
because the government does have a way to get their money and 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 they will go through taking people's taxes if they got a job but again, to collect he, that debt. He as an individual yeah. doesn't pay taxes. Okay. His corporation has a basically has a balance sheet that says you owe this much taxes for your profits, but then they also have a very long <coughs> list of write-offs. Some of them are probably paid to 501c3 uh, organizations like some of the ones that we work for okay. uh, to offset those taxes so that he can get a rebate. Okay. But that's his business. So as an individual, if you looked at his credit report, there probably would be nothing on it. Okay. Because he as an individual doesn't do anything because if he did, then he might have to face the consequences. Okay. You answered my question. Thank you. So that's why his wages were garnished. He didn't get a pay. Yeah, because he because only poor people get wages. So and I mean, the there are some people that are paid well that get wages. But there is a there's a clear line between somebody who has wealth and is able to set up a financial infrastructure to insulate themselves from consequences, and someone who receives a paycheck that can be garnished, that can be a, addressed by the government. Was there another question back there? Um, so when I realized, you know, learning all these lessons, this system, this structure is designed to produce more debt because debt is profitable, that is a way to control people, yeah. that is a way to yeah. get people to continue yeah. to work. Because most of our work doesn't go into paying for our livelihoods. It goes for paying for the debts um, that, that, um, that pay for our homes, things like that. Um, so because debt is profitable and the entire financial sector is designed to continue to produce more and more and more of it, you know, we have an obligation not to pay debts back to the financial system, but to figure out a way to make our financial system work for us, to figure out a financial system that does not continue to produce the oppression and slavery um, that is debt. And the reality here is that this has a disproportionate effect also on children. How many people here grew up in poor households? How many people here have answered a debt collector's <laughs> call for their parents? How does that feel? Okay, anybody want to speak to that? How did that feel? Uh, it felt terrible. <laughs> what, what did you think when, when that when that call came in? Well, they would call at any time of the day or night, and so it was very intimidating. Yeah. What does it What does it tell you about you know the larger world, the larger structure? What does it tell you about your parents? I mean, you feel bad because your parents want to avoid this. Mm -hmm. It, it also keeps us from really supporting our children, you know, and also in the fact that we have to work so hard to pay these debts back, and the fact that, you know, we're paying money <coughs> back the debts instead of, you know, buying kids toys or, you know, spending time with them, playing with them. So one of the things that really hurt me as a collector was all those times that a kid answered the phone. And you're trained to intimidate that child, to make him, make his parents feel bad because they're not going to pay your debt. And I know as a kid, when that phone rang at 7 o'clock at night and you didn't know the number, we all knew who it was. And there was a pressure, a tension in the room. Um, there was, it was palpable. <coughs> you could feel that your parents knew. You could, it, it just felt wrong for me as a child, and it felt wrong for me as a collector to put that on the child. So, um, you know, we're focusing on, you know, the people, putting people first. And I think that the number one goal of how we reorganize our system should be putting our children first. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, knowing how the system works, hearing this, as organizers who are kind of in the know, can we not also flip the script on these collectors and actually educate them when they call, actually look forward to their phone calls so we can educate them to you know, get on the people's side? <laughs> um, collectors are, I know, I, I turned off my soul for mm. about five years. You know, you cannot do this with a conscience. And you might get through to a few people, but the majority of people that are on that phone are looking for a bonus check to pay back their debts. You know, the best collectors are debtors. Like I said, you know, most of the people you are going to be working with if you work at a collection agency are single mothers and ex-offenders that, that don't have any opportunity. But we can't educate each other about the rules because most of how collections are done is completely illegal. And if a complaint was filed for every violation, um, you know, you have 10 or 15 violations on every phone call. The CFPB would be, you know, overloaded. A lot of these agencies, a lot of parts of the system would be able to be shut down. So I think that's, you know, perfect time that we can transition into talking about some of the solutions um, that we have for this system and some of the ways that we're working to try to break it.